Our first reading today from the first book of Kings begins with this verse. The Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night. God said, Ask something of me, and I will give it to you. What would we ask for if one of us had that dream and were made that offer? It's good for us to keep in mind in trying to understand this scripture passage who Solomon was and what was the situation of his life. He was about 20 years old when he became king after his father David, and he inherited a vast and wealthy kingdom that was at peace because David had conquered many enemies. The temptation for Solomon to ask for the wrong things may have been great, and God mentions what some of those wrong things would have been. Solomon could have asked for greater riches, which is, strangely, one of the dangers of wealth. It can lead a wealthy person to want more and more, to the point that he can't even enjoy the wealth he has. Solomon could have asked for a long life for himself so that he would have as much time as possible to enjoy all the material possessions and the power he had. This folly is spoken about in one of Jesus' parables, the parable of the rich fool, who says to himself, Now as for you, you have so many good things stored up for many years. Rest, eat, drink, be merry. But God says to him, You fool! This night your life will be demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, to whom will they belong? Thus will it be for the one who stores up treasure for himself, but is not rich in what matters to God. And finally, Solomon could have asked for the life of his enemies, which highlights another pitfall of the very wealthy and powerful, that they could be constantly anxious about someone else taking their wealth and power away from them. Remember how King Herod was so disturbed when he heard that the king of the Jews was to be born in Bethlehem. But King Solomon asked for the right thing. He said to the Lord in reply to his dream, O Lord my God, you have made me, your servant, king to succeed my father David. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding heart to judge your people, and to distinguish right from wrong. Solomon, though he was young, already had far more understanding than many who were senior to his age. He knew two things for certain, that he could not rule effectively without God's help, and that there was great responsibility and accountability in the office he had been given. This applies to all of us, actually, whatever may be our state in life. We have to remember and believe that God has given all of us a purpose in this life, and whatever advantages or privileges or offices we have received are to be used in serving Him and our neighbor. The opening verse of our second reading today from St. Paul's letter to the Romans says it very well. Brothers and sisters, we know that all things work for good for those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. This is why we seek first and foremost the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then everything else will be taken care of. Our relationship with God and His kingdom is the treasure buried in a field. It is the pearl of great price. If and when we recognize that and are ready to subordinate everything else to it, we will have unlocked the secret to our earthly happiness and will be the most effective instruments of God's will in this world. Solomon understood that at a young age, and so he's been remembered through 3,000 years of human history as the wisest and most benevolent of rulers. He asked as God's servant and the people's for an understanding heart to judge wisely and to distinguish right from wrong. What he asked for, in essence, was the Holy Spirit's gifts of knowledge, understanding, and counsel, 
which we are given through the sacraments of the Church, especially confirmation, which Emily Marie will receive very shortly. I know many Catholics can have difficulty in distinguishing between these three gifts of the Holy Spirit. I do too, to be honest. So I found an explanation offered by the Holy Spirit Fathers, a religious order, to be very helpful. Allow me to share this with you. The gift of knowledge enables the soul to evaluate created things at their worth, that is, in their relation to God. Knowledge unmasks the pretense of creatures, reveals their emptiness, and points out their only true purpose as instruments in the service of God. It shows us the loving care of God even in adversity, and directs us to glorify Him in every circumstance of life. Guided by the light of knowledge, we put first things first and prize the friendship of God beyond all else. The gift of understanding helps us to grasp the meaning of the truths of our holy religion. By faith we know them, but by understanding we learn to appreciate and relish them. It enables us to penetrate the inner meaning of revealed truths and through them to be quickened to newness of life. Our faith ceases to be sterile and inactive, but inspires a mode of life that bears eloquent testimony to the faith that is in us. And finally, the gift of counsel endows the soul with supernatural prudence, enabling it to judge promptly and rightly what must be done, especially in difficult circumstances. Counsel applies the principles furnished by knowledge and understanding to innumerable concrete cases that confront us in the course of our daily duty as parents, teachers, public servants, and Christian citizens. Counsel is supernatural common sense, a priceless treasure in the quest of salvation. My brothers and sisters in Christ, Solomon asked for and received these gifts of the Holy Spirit so he could serve God well in discharging the duties that he as king had been given to fulfill whatever duties we've been given as our part in God's great plan of salvation, let us follow Solomon's example and seek first the Spirit's gifts and the kingdom of God. We are strengthened in the Holy Spirit like nowhere else each time we celebrate this Holy Eucharist.